go, go, go. So we're super excited. So what you're looking at right now on the screen is a lightsaber. Now, before anybody questions the color of said lightsaber, I am now a Jedi Master. I trained under Luke Skywalker, and I also know that he trained under Obi-Wan. So I thought I'd honor both of my masters by actually duplicating and kind of creating my own little look and feel to honor what's going on. So this is my current one, and we want to do a nice little product shot for, you know, maybe one day I'll trade up and get another one. I can put it on Etsy or something. So this is actually what we're going to be striving today. Now I'm going to be going through the steps on how I created this completely in ZBrush for hard surface. So let's actually pop on over boop, to ZBrush right here. And you can see I have this basic scene layout here. And so what I'm going to cover is basically how to uh, attain this back panel look. And the same tricks I use for that back panel you can utilize to make the lightsaber as well. So first things first, let's go ahead and I'm going to hide everything by holding shift and tapping that little eye icon. I'm going to come down to the lightsaber and then I'm going to go ahead and say insert. And I'm going to insert a plain 3D. Now if you are a little new to ZBrush, do not worry because I'm going to walk through and just explain everything that I do. So if I hit Shift F, you can see that this plane has a lot of quads to it, but I actually want to minimize this to keep my life a little bit simple. So what I'm going to do is actually open up Geometry and reconstruct Subdiv a couple times. This is actually going to um, kind of drop down the density of it and give me some lower active points, which is a little bit easier to work with when you're doing hard surface in ZBrush. I'm going to go ahead and delete higher. And now I'm just going to apply a little bit of thickness to this. And what, the way I'm going to do it is with a Z modeler brush. So I'm going to hit B for brush, Z for Z modeler, and M. So you're going to hear a lot of those hotkey shortcuts as you navigate through the program. And from here, I'm going to hover over this space. And if I press and hold the space bar, you can see here that I have a lot of little menus that I can work with. The way we're going to look at this is actually from the top down to the bottom. So I'm always focusing on this first menu. What is it that I want to do with ZModeler? And what I want to do with it is use QMesh. And then the second one is what is that QMesh going to do? Notice it's saying a single poly. A single poly means if I hover over any one of these faces and I drag, it's going to go ahead and apply just to that one. And what's really cool is that if I do an action like this and I touch another one, it's going to repeat that action really, really quickly. But that's actually what I don't want. So I'm going to back that up a minute hover over that poly, press and hold the space bar, and say poly group all. I'm going to go ahead and just drag this out, giving it a little bit of thickness. Now I'm going to go ahead and snap to the front, and I'm going to hit W to give me the gizmo. What's really cool about the gizmo is that both rotation, scaling, and manipulating, moving, it's all active at the same time. So I can come through here and actually stretch this out a little bit and just kind of you know, take the actual plane and see if it's something that I want. Now I'm going to turn on my lightsaber, and I'm going to make sure that my lightsaber itself is actually going to, it's going to pair well with it, because we are going for a little bit of a product shot. So I'm going to say, let's actually have a nice little panel. We can scale this down, and we can get something just a little bit closer to that. So I'm just kind of coming through and making sure that it seems to fit fairly well. Okay, great, wonderful. Now at this point, I, what I want to do is actually up res this a little bit, but I don't want the shape itself to change because we're going to be using a technique called Live Boolean. Live Boolean is a really awesome technique that's going to allow us to actually make quick cuts exactly where we want and manipulate those cuts. So I'm going to come here to the Geometry tab. I'm going to turn off the Smooth Modifier button. When I have this turned on and I divide, notice that my mesh is actually bending out and smoothing. That's not what I want. I actually want this to stay nice and flat and, and sharp. So I'm going to turn that off, and then I'm going to divide up a few times. And if I turn Shift F off and on, you'll see now I have a lot more geometry to work with. But I'm going to go ahead and delete lower, because now I have something that's a little bit more manageable for when I make my final cuts. Now, what I'm going to do is actually activate Live Boolean at this time. But let's go ahead and grab just a random shape. It doesn't matter. We're going to grab just a cylinder. And I'm actually going to go ahead and change my brush to B, I, and T. This is our insert IMM primitives. And if I turn on the gizmo, I can actually use the arrow key and navigate to something more what I would like. And we're going to kind of play with some imperial decorative components here. So I'm going to grab this guy here. Now I said I'm going to turn on live Boolean. And now I'm going to scale this down. And what's really neat is that when Live Boolean is turned on, notice nothing's happening, 
right? We're just kind of intersecting. Ooh, nothing, right? Well, if we focus over here by hitting Shift M for the magnifying glass, on this object, I have a couple options. I have a welding option, or basically, you, uh, you, yeah, just basically merging two objects together. Then I have a subtractive and then an intersect. With live bullying turned on, if you look at my screen and I click the subtractive, notice we kind of get this anti-aliasing effect. When I turn off the wireframe, you'll now notice that I can move the shape around and it's actively and lively giving me a preview of what that cut's going to look like. And this is a really effective way to pop a hole through anything within ZBrush. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go ahead, come over here, scale this down. Now, it disappeared for a second because we're actually working with a mesh. So you could turn that wireframe back on, really stretch this out for a second so we can see that. And now I'm going to go ahead and just navigate this a little bit over here and get something maybe like that. Now, I want to stretch this, but if I go ahead and start stretching, notice that the roundness at the top is deforming. I want to preserve that as much as possible. So instead of using the gizmo for this, I'm going to turn off live Boolean and hit the wireframe with Shift F. You'll see here that my geometry for the shape is really, really low. Well, this is actually going to be a good thing because I can come up here, pressing and holding Control or Command if you're on Mac, and picking the mass lasso. And I'm going to isolate this top section, turn the gizmo back on, and now I can go ahead and stretch that down a little bit. When you're, Z, when you're doing any hard surface in ZBrush, ZModeler and Gizmo, they're like best friends. They want to hang out on the weekend and while you're working just to get you in trouble, but you're going to get really good results with them. So from here, always think about ZModeler, Gizmo, hard surface. It's a, it's a match made in heaven. And so now that I have a lot more space with this, if I turn the live Boolean back on, you can see here that now I'm getting a really nice shape. Now, that's just one spot. So how do we make this a little cooler? And actually, let's scale this down just a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and just center this, scale that down, just give me something like that. OK. Now what I want to do is I want to actually duplicate this a couple times. And I can do this one of two ways. I can either just sit here, and with the gizmo open, I can press and hold Control, and I can drag out a brand new shape. And then while I'm still holding on to this little green arrow, if I let go of control, I can actually drag this out multiple times. That's one way of doing it. However, there's a cooler way of doing it, I promise. And it's called array mesh. So I'm actually going to come over here with that object selected, go to array mesh. I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. I'm going to lock the transpose position and actually the main position. And the reason why I want to do this is I really want to focus on the main position of the first object. Now in ZBrush, the, the axis is Y is up and down, X is left and right, and Z is depth, right? So from here, what I'm going to want to do is actually repeat this a couple times. So let's say maybe five times. And then I'm going to go ahead on the Y axis, and I'm going to start stretching this out. And you can see here now I have those components there. What's cool about this is that if I turn off the live Boolean and turn on Shift F, notice that my geometry count didn't change, and I'm only seeing the wireframe on one section. That's because this is just giving me a preview of what this would look like when I accept the mesh as a whole. But what's cooler about it is I can actually tap this number, and I can say, you know what, I want that to be a value of 6, and control the distance equally from each other exactly how I want. And then again, I can just turn on Live Boolean, and I can say, boom, that's a good shape. And then I can take it a next step further, and I can come over here to Geometry, Modify Topology, Mirror and Weld, and now I have that on both sides. Again, Array Mesh is still working with me, so it's giving me a really cool preview. Now I can combine those techniques, and I can actually go ahead and say, you know what, I can drag this out, and I can do something like that. And again, I'm still working super low. So with the Control Drag with the Gizmo and Array Mesh, I can get some really cool options. Now from here, what I want to do is just kind of break up the symmetry just a little bit because I feel like this is a little too much. So I'm going to go ahead and come back to Array Mesh. And now when I'm done and I'm nice and satisfied, I can actually go ahead and say Make Mesh. And what you'll see as soon as I do that is that my active points went from 560 to 2080 because now all of those components are actually together and it's real geometry now. So from here, what I want to do is kind of break this up a little bit, like I was saying. So I'm going to just go ahead and offset this just a bit, something like that. 
Actually, you know what? Let's go up a little bit. And I'll show you why in a second. So from here, the reason why I went up is maybe I actually want to flatten this section out. So I'm going to clear this mask. Let's turn off live Boolean again just so we can see the mesh a little bit more clear. I'm going to go ahead and mask off this top port. But before I let go of the mask, if I press and hold Alt alongside of it, notice that that mask selection turns white. Because when that happens and I let go, it's going to do the exact opposite inverse. It's going to select the section that I want and mask everything else. So that's a quick way to come through and manipulate that one spot. And then I can come down and maybe bring this down a little bit. Perfect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and just isolate this one section. And I'm going to introduce a new tool called Knife Curve. And Knife Curve is really cool because it's going to go ahead and not only chop this area like this and give me a nice little poly group, but if I had everything visible, but let's say I only had this one masked off. So let's come here, let's mask that off. That was a terrible mask in, right? That was terrible. <laughs> Don't do that. Great. Now I'm going to come through here. I'm going to chop that. And it's going to cut that down. But notice what it did was it actually rebuilt this section with its own poly group. And that's because the knife curve not just cuts it in place, but again, it's actually rebuilding some geometry for you, giving you a much cleaner cut. Now, this is super low resolution, but we're only using this to cut against the actual geometry itself. But if we wanted to quickly and effectively just come on in here and just up res this a bit before we use live Boolean to make our final cut, what I'll do is same thing, go to geometry, I'm gonna go ahead and take that little smooth option down and just gonna divide this up a few times then delete lower. And now we have just a little bit more resolution for this cut. Now, you notice that the top and the bottom don't quite match with each other, and that's OK. What we can do, I'm going to send this to the home position, and I'm going to come up here to mirror and weld. And you notice I mirror and weld from screen left to screen right. But now I want to do that from top to bottom. So I can actually turn on this little Y axis, and then I can go ahead and hit that mirror and weld. Now, it duplicated this because of its current position. So if that ever happens to you where you hit mirror and weld and it's giving you something you didn't quite want, we need to send this to its home position. So I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and do uh, Alt, send that to its home position there. Just hit the home, boop. And now this is world center. And I can go ahead and do that mirror and weld. But you're asking yourself too, well, now you got to reset that position. you got to manually go back there and do that. So before we do that option, I'm going to introduce something called home stage or target stage. So boop, 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 boop. Give me one second. Come on in. Don't you love it when like you're giving a demo and you're like, oh man, where's that one thing? Yeah, my thing's off. <laughs> yeah, every time. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So geometry, hold on one second. Stager, there it is. Perfect. So now we have the stager position. So what we can do is we can actually send the home stage and say, this is where I want this to live every single time. And when you click that, let's actually put that more in the middle because I'm a little OCD. So I'm going to say home stage right there. Perfect. Now, again, if I turn on that live Boolean, there it is. But again, I actually want to go ahead and send this to that home position and then do a proper mirror and weld on that duplication. So I'm going to go from here now and I'm going to send this to its home position and I'm going to set this as a target stage. And this is what's really cool because I can switch between those two spots. So now I can utilize this target stage. I can go back up to modify topology, mirror and weld on both Y and axis, and then I can go to stager and I can switch back. Done. So this way now I can remember those two point in times at any time. I can also just uncheck those if I don't need them anymore. But for this purpose, instead of having to manually move everything, that's a really quick and effective way to go about that. So now that we got this built, let's go ahead and do a quick cut. So I'm actually going to go ahead and put this all in a folder. And we can do this really fast. Instead of coming through the subtool menu and trying to grab everything and then manipulate in a folder, make a folder, drag it, with the gizmo open, I can actually select this nice little transpose all selected subtools, aka the pizza box. I can grab this. And with shift and control, I can come through, select just these two objects, and then I can go ahead and say Control F. And it's going to give me this little warning, say, hey, do you want to put these things in a new folder? Yes, I absolutely do. So I'm going to say, yep, no problem. And now I can name that folder, and I can call this my panel. And now everything in that folder is condensed, just those two objects. So now from here, 
I can go ahead and turn the gizmo off and the pizza box, we're done with that. Turn live Boolean on. And now I can come through here and I can say merge or Boolean the folder. Once I do that, it's gonna give me a brand new mesh that I can now work with. Now again, I'm not worried about geometry or any type of topology at this point because we're not gonna animate this. This is simply for a product shot. So all these little triangles and stuff like that, none of that really bothers me. However, we could clean this up if we wanted to. And a way we can go about doing that is I'm just gonna give it just a little bit more subdivision just so that it has a better fighting chance. And I can come through here with Z Remesher now with zero measure, I'm gonna give everybody the secret sauce on how I like to use it because it seems to be the best successful, is that I'm actually gonna give the target polys a little bit more. I'm gonna say something like between 15 and 20 is a good starting spot. And this is because when we have a lot of geometry that we wanna remesh, zero mesher has to look at the mesh integrity itself and then it has to say, okay, this is how I map the quads. However, if we don't give it enough geometry to start with, it's going to fail. So we're always gonna bump this up a little bit more. We're only working with 105,000 active points, but starting at 20 is a really good spot. From here, I'm gonna keep adapt turned on, but I'm gonna turn the adaptive slider down to zero. And the reason why is because I want the adaptive uh, components of Zebra Mesher to look at the mesh and say, please place my quads exactly where the mesh is lying. However, I want the quads to be as even as possible. So when it's slid down to zero, all the quads will be even instead of scaling or dropping down the quad size to match the mesh. But it's still gonna look at the mesh integrity. And then finally, I turn on keep groups, but I slide this down to zero. And that's because with the smooth groups at zero, if it's higher than that, when you zero mesh, your mesh will shrink a little bit. And I don't want that either. So I want basically the mesh to stay as true to size as possible. And then from here, I'll be able to uh, project back any details if I had it, which we don't really need to at this time because Ellie over here, she's gonna detail it up in Cinema 4D. So now I'm gonna go ahead and say zero mesher. And we're just gonna give it a moment to think and look at the mesh and say, how should we make this look as clean as possible? And you see that nice orange bar at the top is gonna come through and boom, there we go. We have really nice, clean mesh that I can work with. The shape itself didn't change. And if I would like to, I now can, bless you. I can now go ahead and turn that smooth on. And I also have polygroups here. So I can also say crease by polygroups. And now I can also, if we really want to have some fun, come over here to polygroups, group by normals, which will now, anytime there's a 45 degree angle or a plane change, it's going to give me a different polygroup, which now if I combine that with crease by polygroups, and I start subdividing, I can subdivide a little bit, giving me a little bit better resolution, but nothing really, I didn't lose those edges. I didn't smooth anything down that I wanted to, even if I had the smooth turned on. So, but for this, I'm just gonna keep it, we'll keep it without subdivisions for ease of use. Now from here, before we run out of too much time, let's get some paneling in here real quick. So I'm gonna go basically do the exact same thing. I'm gonna come in here and do insert, and I'm gonna insert a plane, now we got a giant plane here. So I'm gonna go ahead and scale this down. And again, I'm gonna turn on the wireframe and I'm also gonna solo this. And I'm gonna to go to geometry. And again, I'm just gonna reconstruct this down to something very, very simple. I'm gonna go all the way down to basically nothing. And from here, now just gonna rinse and repeat the same steps you just watched me do, except for this time I'm going to come on over, I'm gonna place this over here. Maybe scale this down a little bit. Perfect. And now I'm going to maybe duplicate this one. And now at this point, I'm actually going to move this gizmo over here. Maybe stretch this out just a bit, giving me just a little bit of variation. And I'm gonna do that one more time. I'm gonna scale this one down. Perfect, we'll do something like that. Actually, let's do something a little bit more like this. Boop, okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and mask off this one corner. But again, you notice how I masked off that one corner, but I didn't hold Alt. This time I can actually just tap with Control, pressing Control, tapping anywhere in this space. It's going to invert that mask for me. And now I can use the gizmo, send this over by just pressing, holding Alt and tapping one time on this little icon. And now I can push this in here. And this is looking pretty good, so I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to clear that mask. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and Let's control our polygroups. So I'm gonna go polygroups, I'm gonna go auto groups. This way I can select the ones that I would like. 
And I'm going to reference back to my preview image. And you can see here I had a couple different shapes. But again, because we were actually referencing a bunch of Star Wars stuff, we thought, you know what, we can actually make this kind of our own. So from here, we can, we'll just change it up a little bit. You have the other one. So I'm going <laughs> to grab this one here. <laughs> like I just threw you everybody. Like, yeah, you can have this one. You can All do right. whatever you like. Okay, perfect. It's my world, right? Yeah. So I'm going to come through and maybe scale this one down. We'll lengthen it a little bit. Send that over here. And again, we're just like having some fun figuring out what looks good, all this good jazz. And then, you know what? Let's actually scale this one here. Let's blow this one up. And this is actually the power of polygroups is that at any point in time, if I go to my auto groups, I now can just quickly select one of them. And notice how these edges are actually like, these aren't straight because I pulled from this original one. So a little trick is that you can actually go to our clip curve. And when you have edges that are not perfectly straight, but you want them to be, we can actually come through, mask that section off, invert this, I'm gonna come through. And let's actually use, not, uh, I'm using knife curve, let's use clip curve, there we go. I'm gonna come through and that's gonna, clip curve is actually gonna make me have nice straight edges like such. I can go ahead and push this down just for fun. Again, now I can select this guy, mask it off. I'm going to send this home by pressing Alt, not duplicate it. We're going to go ahead and move this over. And we can actually pull this back. Oh, looks, we have another one. Yay. Let's actually clean that one up. So let's grab this one. Let's move that there. We don't need that one. And now let's grab this piece right here. I'm going to send this over, put this back in line where I had it. Awesome. Something like this. Now, of course, if we wanted to, to delete anything that we accidentally created or that we decided we don't want, I can actually press and hold Control Shift and press and hold Alt now and just hide that piece. And I can go to Geometry and I can go ahead and do a Modify Topology, Delete Hidden. And now just real fast, before I hand it on over, I do want to showcase one thing as we come through is I want to give this some thickness and then I want to show you a really awesome feature called Bevel Pro. So I'm going to give this just some quick thickness. We're going to pretend that it's done. So let's go ahead and Z modeler. I'm going to say Q mesh all polygroups. Again, I did one aspect, but it's identifying all the different polygroups that they are. If you would like to make this all one polygroup at the same time, you press and hold control and tap W. And then that's going to allow me to drag this out. But if I wanted to add nice bevels across all of these really quickly and not do it by hand, what I'm going to do is actually divide it up a little bit, give me some resolution, maybe a bit more. And now I'm going to go ahead and go to polygroups. I'm going to go with group by normals because what Bevel Pro is going to do is it's going to identify all the different polygroups and their, in, and their connection. And then it's going to go ahead and give me a bevel on that side. So if I go ahead and go up to Z plugin, Bevel Pro, and I open up Bevel Pro, it's going to open up a really nice fun window for me. And now you can see that I have all these like nice red dots, blue dots, and like pink bars. And what this means to you is if we scale in here real quick, is that where the pink is is what it's cutting. So if I actually go ahead and say auto apply, you can see that that pink bar is actually where that's going to be. But if I turn that off for a second, you'll notice that the blue is where the original mesh is lying, the center point of that mesh. The red is where it's actually going to intersect with that current part. And I can even preview what this mesh looks like by going to preview edges and actually playing with the resolution slider if we don't want it to be super thick. And I can change between bevels and chamfer at any time. So if I wanted it rounder or sharper, the world is your oyster. You can choose between the two. And now in this state, if I say OK, it's going to utilize live Boolean and generate another mesh. But let's say I don't really want that. This time, I just want this to actually cut. Again, we'll do auto apply and we'll go ahead and say OK. And now if I go ahead and look and zoom all the way in, you'll see that I have these nice little bevels here. And what this is going to really allow me to do is that when we actually kick it over to Ellie here in just a few minutes, this is going to help with the light capture and it's going to just bring that product to life a little bit more. And so again, from this point forward, once I'm done and I place everything, I can actually go ahead and hit go Z. And then that can send it on over to Cinema 4D where we can play with the Redshift. Now, so that all those steps I just showed you is exactly what you would need to do in order to create a panel that looks a lot like this. So let's turn everything off. Grab this panel right here, this lightsaber. 
And let's turn this one. Our guy, I got that one selected. Boom. And so that's how I created this panel here. From this moment forward, now I'm going to go ahead. I think I'm going to hand it to you because I finished pretty quick. Yeah? Yeah. Sure? Yeah, you sure you want it? I'm good. Okay, cool. I'm so ready. now we're going to render this and make this look really awesome. So everybody, Ellie, wait. Thanks, Ian. You are welcome. Okay, hey everyone, how's it going? Let me head over to this project in Cinema 4D, and we're going to render this in Redshift. Boop, boop. Uh, I don't need that, but I do need that. Cool. So I said to Ian, I was like, how much time are we going to have at the end? And right. he, was like, he said to me, how much time do you need? And I was like, you know what? I can maybe get this done in 20 minutes. And I thought it would be fun to set myself a little bit of a timer and see if I can recreate this final render in 20 minutes. And actually, if you see, we have like a 50 minute cut off. So I'm going to turn this round so you can all see. I don't think the stream will be able to see, but we've actually got 25 minutes until the end. And that's my new timer. And I'm not even going to be able to see it. So hopefully you can all tell me how much time I've actually got. So we're going to run through this a little bit quickly, but hopefully we'll come up with a really nice looking shot. And now I've already wasted two minutes talking, so let me get into it. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Cool. So I'm going to start off by opening up my render view. And let me just kick this over to here. Cool. So for now, I've actually just disabled my subdivision surface, just because I want everything to be super fast. Uh, again, so it can be done in a very short amount of time. And I'm going to start off by throwing in a dome light. So the main thing here, we're going to create a couple of materials for the lightsaber and for the back panel. And then we're going to create some nice looking lighting and get that final shot. And maybe a little post effects as well. Cool. So I've thrown in a dome light. And let me just grab some textures in here. So all of this stuff, all the textures I'm about to use, apart from the lightsaber, can all be found in the asset browser. But I've saved them to a folder just in case the internet doesn't work. So let me just throw in this HDR image. This is the GI Empty Room, which you should have access to if you have Cinema 4D. And then I'm just going to rotate it, because I want the light to come in from the left-hand side. So as I rotate this round, we can get some nice sort of product lighting here. There we go. Let's, let's leave it like that. And then I'm going to switch off my background just so it doesn't show in the back. Now from here. I'm going to create my materials, and then I'm going to create my lighting. So I'm going to double click and double click. The first is going to be our back panel, and the next is going to be our lightsaber. Let's just throw these on to here. So we've got our two back panels, and we've got our lightsaber. So Ian actually textured this inside of Substance, and so I have access to these different texture maps. And if I just double click, we can see what they look like. I'm going to show you how we can put these together really, really quickly inside of our node editor. It's really pretty, isn't it? It's very pretty. So I'm just going to take all of these, and I'm going to drag and drop them inside my node editor. Let them load. So what have we got? We have our base color. We have our emissive. We have our roughness, metallic, and then our normal. Cool. So really quickly, I went through this in my first presentation, talked a little bit about color space. If you're working in ACCG, which we are by default, we need to change our color space of our texture maps to ensure that we get the right, the right look. If it's being plugged into a color input, for example, the base color, it needs to be set to sRGB. And if it's controlling numerical data like roughness, it needs to be set to raw. So my emission and my color can be set to sRGB. And then everything else can be set to raw. And we're just going to throw these in. So base color goes to color. Metallic goes to our metalness. Roughness goes to roughness. Emission, the way that we get that is we can come into our material. We can switch on emission, which is the weight value. Let's do something like two. And then we need to command click the emission color on this little dot here, tiny little dot, and that's going to add the input for us where we can then plug our emission. And then finally, we need to add a bump map to tell Redshift that this particular texture is a bump map or a normal map. We then just need to change this input map type to tangent space normal because it's a normal. 
and then we can plug everything together. Let's make this a little bit smaller in scale and let's get rid of that so you can actually see what I'm making. Cool, so here we go. And as Ian said, I'm gonna change the color of the lightsaber. He explained why at the beginning. Please don't tell me off. I like the blue, I'm very um. sorry. So I'm gonna throw a ramp in, not in that one. I'm gonna throw it in the emission. So let's throw that in there. And I'm gonna use the ramp to remap and recolor my emission. Let me just solo that and we can see what it looks like. And I'm just going to recolor this white not to be some kind of blue, maybe something like that. I like blue. Blue is really cool. I like the blue. Sorry if you don't like the blue, everyone. It's no, it's my, my lightsaber. It's my lightsaber. It's mine, yeah. It's, it's our lightsaber it now. So. In my mind. Zoom. Cool. Right, so we have blue. We've recolored that. And I'm going to leave it as it is because, I mean, I don't know how much time I've got. You'll never cool. know. Let's cut in. What are we on? 18? 19. Okay, let's go, let's go. Right, so back panel time. Let's create the back panel. We're just going to really, really easily add a scratch metal texture just to throw this on the background. Because we want the lightsaber to be the main focus, uh, but we do want some nice little grungy detail. So how do we do that? Well, again, these are just going to be two assets from the asset browser. The first of which is going to be a dirt texture, and the next is going to be a scratch texture. So I'm going to drag and drop both of these in, both of these into here, and I Cool, so we can use grayscale texture maps to control our different inputs. And then based on the black and white or the grayscale values, we will get varied values of that particular setting. For example, metalness or roughness. And that's what this is going to do. So if you keep an eye on how this looks, I'm gonna plug this straight into, actually I'm not gonna plug it because it's not UV'd really quickly. Let me just solo this. We're getting a little bit of a strange projection, but we can actually fix this super quickly. Ian was like, shall I UV it? And I was like, don't worry about it. We've got a triplanar node. So if we get a triplanar node, we can get that, chuck that in. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna ignore our UVs and it's gonna fix our projection. Perfect, who needs UVing? Not me. <laughs> and then we can plug that straight into our metalness. And you're gonna see it's gonna really change this look. So we now have our different metalness values. Maybe I'll make it a little bit darker as well. And then we're going to grab our scratches. So let's do the same thing. Plug that inside of here. And then we're going to connect that into our roughness. So perks of working with nodes, you can use them. Let's make it a little bit brighter, actually. We can't really see that. There we go. A bit more. So when working with metalness, the, how dark your, the color is will also depend on uh, the metalness value as well. Cool, so we can take these scratches, which are now controlling our roughness, and we can also have it control our bump. So we can use the same one for different inputs. So this is gonna go in here, and then we're gonna have loads of nice detail. And when we start to add our lighting, it's really gonna kind of bring this, bring this out. I'm going to invert the bump as well. So at the moment, the height scale is a positive value. So um, we'd feel like it coming out. But if we do a negative value, it'll feel like it's going in, like we've got dents inside of our geometry. So let's go minus 0 0.1. Yeah, maybe go minus 0 0.5. How are we going? How are we looking for time? What are we on? Don't worry about it. You're doing great. We're good? We're doing, You're doing good? good. Nice. Fantastic. Nice. I like the element. I can see me sweat a little bit. It's nice. A little bit of entertainment for you all. Okay, cool. Right, so they're my materials. I'm happy with that. And now I'm going to get into some lighting. So the first thing I'm going to do, actually, is... So these little edge areas, these little, these little guys here that Ian created, these need to be emissive. These need to be casting some light through. And at the moment, they don't look like lights. So we can really quickly grab a plane reposition it just behind here, create a quick material with no base color, throw that on the plane, come down to here and find our emission. Where's our emission? Here we go. Let's get some emission going on. 
And we didn't want like a pure, pure white. It's got like a slight hint of yellow. Yeah, just a Ian little was, bit. Ian was giving me loads of like Star Wars facts because I'm going to admit this, I've not seen it. We're going to change no that. No judgment, please, we will from change the crowd. <laughs> cool, so we've got that on there. Now let's do some, let's do some lighting. So at the moment, we've only got our dome light casting this HDR over, sort of coming in from the left-hand side and it's creating this nice blue hue. And so I want to match I'm going to create an extra light on the other side with a, a light to balance it out. And so I'm thinking with a blue, maybe we'll go with like a golden uh, orange color on the other side. So inside of my light menu, let's grab an area light and let's just rotate that a little bit like this. Let's go 90 and let's make it a little bit skinnier. Let's get a little skinny light. We want a little thin light if we're going for a rim light, don't we? So let's put that here. And maybe we come a little bit closer. Let's get into this one. Move this back. Let's go, let's go two, two centimeters. I'm gonna pull that back there. So I'm just looking, I'm looking at this edge here. That's all I'm looking at. And at the moment it's casting light on everything, but I don't want it to be casting light on the back panel, just on the lightsaber. So inside my area light, if I come to my project, we can choose to include or exclude certain objects. In my case, I'm just gonna include my lightsaber. And now we can see we're just getting this nice light on here. Then what we can do is we can come in, we can control our intensity, which is our brightness, pull that down, and then let's get that nice gold yellow color on there, which, which matches this nice, this nice part here. Maybe we go a little bit more yellow. Perfect, right, now, now what do we wanna do? Well, we've added the plane and the emission in the background, but we're not actually getting light being cast. So we need to add some area lights into these areas here. So again, we're just gonna grab ourselves an area light. I'm gonna flip that round on the H. So we're gonna go 180. And then again, we're gonna make it a little bit smaller. And we're just going to throw this in here. Then I'm gonna copy and paste that light. And I'm just gonna move that to match the other side. Cool, we've got that going on. And then let's just reduce these down to maybe something like nine, and we'll match that slightly yellow, slightly yellow color as well. Maybe that's a little bit too much. Okay, cool. Next part, next part. Our lightsaber's on, so we need, some, we need some light being cast. So we've set up our emission, and we're getting a little bit of a blue sort of glow and light at the top, but let's really intensify this by throwing an area light on that as well. So again, living for the area lights today. But I'm gonna change this one to be a cylinder and then let's make it 10 by 10 and then we can rotate this as well, 90 degrees. And let's make it a little bit smaller. So we're gonna go 100 centimeters and then let's just pull that up. So let's pull that up just on the Y, something like this. Cool, so we can see we've got that light going on. We just, we're just we gonna reduce the intensity because at the moment it's a little bit, it's a little bit too much. So maybe we go to 15 and we're going to match that color again, that nice blue tint that we set on that lightsaber. Perfect, maybe, maybe even a little bit less. Okay, perfect. So what next, what next? Well. These panels, these lovely panels that we've set up, at the moment we've got our emission, we've got our light being cast through, but what we'd also have is we'd maybe have those little panels as a grid, casting some, some little bits of light on the side. And so the way that we can do that is if we create some smaller area lights, we can then clone them and then we can reduce the spread to really get and dial in uh, a, a small bit of light. So let's grab another area light. Let's rotate this so it's facing inwards. Let's go to 90 and we're gonna make them teeny tiny. So let's go to, is it 50 by 10? Would that work, 50 by 10? Yes, there we go. So we've got these little side, these little side lights now which will match this. Then what we can do, throw, throw it in a cloner Set it to two by three by one, and maybe we pull them down. So we can now see we have these six lights. At the moment, it's not really, it's not really doing what we want it to do. 
So first of all, let's pull this all the way down, high intensity down to something like nine, match that yellow color again. And then with my cloner selected, instead of having to reposition and rotate every single one, I can use a target effector. And then you'll notice that all of those lights are now targeting this. And if I put my target near my lightsaber, which conveniently it already is, which is great, it's going to target that. Then maybe I pull my cloner back slightly, and you'll see, you can see that it's always going to be pointing towards that target effector. So I can pull that in here. And at the moment, if I just sort of turn all of these lights off apart from the dome light, we can see that we're getting that rim, that edge, but it's, the spread is too big. So we're getting too, too large and too kind of, uh, we're not getting a direct light, which we would have if it was coming through these panels. So the way that we do that is we can come in and we can reduce the spread of our light. So if you were to create a spotlight by using an area light, you would do it this way. You would really pull down the spread. And now I can pull that down. And now we can see we're getting this area here. And if I sort of move my target effector, you'll be able to see we're getting this nice little reflection. We can even animate this. Like if you want an animated product shot, you can have this really nice sort of light reflection going on. So let's just leave that maybe something like that. And let's switch on all the rest of our lights. So final light, yes, final light before we add. How are we going? What are we doing? What have we got? Find out, find out. How are we going? Oh. Are we past 50? No, not yet. Oh, we, oh we're good. No, 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 we, no. Got, we got nine minutes. I'm going to chill out a little bit. Eight minutes. Cool. Final light then. Let's grab one last area light. And the purpose of this one is, so we have our light at the top. We have our emission, which is our lightsaber light. But I want to create an extra little bit of rim lighting, so some even more blue, which is going to bring the lightsaber off of the back panel, which is what we need to do. So let's get our area light. Let's switch this around. So we're going to go 180, and then we're going to direct it. We're going to rotate it down. So we're going to go minus 45. I'm just going to reposition it back here. And this is where we need to do that thing again, where it's only going to be affecting the lightsaber, not the back panel. So we can come into our project, include just the lightsaber. And now we're getting that edge. At the moment, it's a little bit too intense. So we can come in, come into our object, and we can reduce this down to maybe something like 10. And again, match that blue, because this is going to be that extra lighting from the lightsaber. Actually, let's go, let's go really low with that. So we just have this really nice edge. So if I switch everything off, we're getting this really nice blue edge. And as I reposition this, you can see this is what we've just created. And with everything back on, this is our lighting. From here, we're not done. We're not done, we've got some time. So what else can we do? Well, we could add a little bit of volumetric lighting, some fog, some smokiness to this. And the way that we can do that is if we throw in the redshift environment, everything's gonna go white. And the reason for that is by default, when we work with lighting inside of redshift, we have certain levels of what we call ray contribution. So if I go to a particular light and I go to the details tab, we have ray contributions. This is really great if you're trying to increase things like subsurface scattering or GI. And in our case, we want it to be controlling the volume or not controlling the volume. So in most of my lights, I'm actually going to say I want a contribution of zero. I don't want it to be having effect on anything. So let's see which ones do we want. So we don't want the side panels. We don't want the big light, the big blue light but we do want the lightsaber light and we do want the kind of the back two, which are our emission. But at the moment, it's a little bit too intense. Actually, it's a lot too intense. So let's reduce these down, this contribution down to a very low value. Let's go to something like this. And then on the lightsaber light, let's do this. And so now we're getting that nice added volumetric lighting but it's not now blowing out and it's not hiding too much of my details. Okay. So, I mean, we need some glow, right? Yeah, we, we need, need some glow. glow. We need Bl some glow. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So the way that we can add some glow 
is we can do some color correction post effects all inside of Redshift. So we can actually create our final render inside of here without having to necessarily go into things like Photoshop or After Effects to do post or compositing, which I'm a huge fan of, but I want to show you how it can be done in here as well. So let's go over to our lens effects inside of our Redshift camera. And then we have something called Bloom. Bloom is our glow. So if I override this, we then have an intensity and a threshold. Let me reduce my threshold, and you're going to see we're going to get a lot more glow happening as it kicks in. Let me end of view. Maybe do we need to pull that down a little? Why am I not seeing this? This isn't good. Let's go into my settings. Hey, there we go. So you just okay. had to check on Bloom. There we go. Just check that Bloom just on. Check it. And then we have our threshold, and we have that nice glowing effect going on. One thing I will do is I want to have more glow on the lightsaber than I have coming from the lights in the background. So what we could do is we could just reduce our lights. So if we, we could reduce these down because the intensity of your light is going to depend on how much glow and bloom effect you're having. But what we could also do is we can add gobos, which are cookies over the top of our lights. So just for speed, normally I would probably create one that matches the look of these lights. But inside the asset browser, again, which everyone can, can find, we have this grid. So we can just throw this grid inside this texture on my area lights, and it's really going to reduce that lighting, but we're still getting a little bit of glow, which is, again, really, really nice. Finally, because we've got a little bit of time, a little bit of time left. How much time have we got left? How are we going? Three minutes. Ah, OK. You can do it. You can do okay, it. We can, do can it. do it. we can do it. So inside my lightsaber, what I will do is I want to bring it, I want to bring it off of the back panel a little bit. At the moment, they're both looking a little bit too dark. So without having to go back into substance or back into anything else, I can actually do some color correction inside of Redshift. If I add a color correct node to my base color, if I just up the gamma slightly, it's going to brighten this texture map and again, bring it off that back panel. We could even come in and grab the Redshift camera choose my focus distance to be my lightsaber, add a little bit of a little bit of bokeh on here. So now that bloom's a little bit too intense. Let's come back in. So this one's now kicked in. Let's change my threshold to four. There we go. So we've added some bokeh in here. Maybe we'll go down a little bit lower. And again, this is just going to blur out, add a little bit of depth of field to that background. Again, making our product, which is our lightsaber, our main focus. And then finally, let's come in, grab some settings. And we can even apply LUTs inside of Redshift. And it comes with like over, over 100 LUTs for you to choose from. We can just enable that. And then the one that I liked is, let me come down to here, is... If I can take that, here we go. There's one that says future, future one. Do we go for That's a powerful lightsaber. What do we think? What do we think? This one? We like that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then let's <laughs> reduce the strength. So we have a strength slider because that's a little bit too intense. Let's pull that down just a touch. And then back in optical, we can also add a little bit of like a vignette. And then in, what, 20, 25 minutes? we've been able to recreate a nice lightsaber product shot render. Nice. Thank you very much, everyone.